Do you hear me? Yes, just listen. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. You know what the mystery is? It's a secret. That's why I'm speaking like this, because I'm going to tell you a mystery. So we are going to talk about the mystery this morning, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced the hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. And we will come back to this text a bit later. As you have know from the last message I spoke, mainly from chapter 9, in the letter of Paul to Roman, chapter 9, 10, and 11 deals with Jews and Gentiles and God's plan of salvation. And uh, Paul will contrast Israel's rejection of the Messiah Jesus with the Gentiles who accepted and received Jesus. And then he will come to make a very striking statement that we have in this text here, all Israel will be saved. Because in chapter 11, we start with a question, and I will go very quickly uh, on slide number four with uh, arguments to answer these questions. And Paul is asking, then has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Because we saw in chapter nine before that this is what happened, the hardening. They hardened, they chose to obtain justifications or salvation or election through observing the law and doing what was right in the law and they failed because God we learn in chapter 9 and you you need maybe to to go back to that message to understand fully what I'm going to talk about today but to see the, the character of God in chapter 9, the sovereignty of God in chapter 9, how God makes the election. That's what we spoke about, the election of Israel in chapter 9. But today we're going to answer that question. So if Israel has failed to obtain righteousness and salvation and election, so that's why Paul is asking in a, as a way of conclusion, it's going somewhere with that, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? And then the answer is, of course not, he has not. And, and then, from that question, he's going to give us a series of arguments that we are going to look very quickly, because we will save some time instead of reading the old uh, chapters and some of the arguments. And the first one, he says, I myself, I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. So of course God has not rejected his people. Look. Paul, me, I'm a Benjamite, I'm an Israelite, and I am saved. So he used his own example as argument number one. God has not rejected because I'm a believer and I'm, I'm a Jew. And the uh, uh, second argument, Paul shows also uh, through the, election, the example of um, Elijah that God is preserving a remnant of saved Jews. And then we read a bit later in chapter 11, Elijah the prophet complained to God, Lord, I'm the only one left faithful. Everybody turned to Baal and everything. And then God answered, no, I have 7,000 that have not bowed to Baal. So, and then the text continues and saying, so to at the present time. So just like God in the time of Elijah had preserved a remnant of faithful followers, in today's time, there is still a remnant of faithful believers among the Jewish nations. And you have heard many times of the Messianic Jews. That's how we mainly uh, call them today. Many of them want to be called, instead of being called Christians or the church, they like to be called Messianic Jews. They are Jewish people. In the sense that they are not Gentiles like us from different nations, they are from the nation of Israel, but they have acknowledged Jesus to be the Messiah and they have believed for their salvation. So in every generation, God has kept, kept a remnant of believers in the Jewish nation. And it is, again, 
described as a work of grace. It cannot be uh, worked or deserved or earned or something. The third argument that we see here is like a two short illustration that points to Abraham and the patriarch. And then chapter 11, verse 16, it talks about like this. If the dough offered as first fruit is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So that is an argument that Paul is using to answer that question, has God rejected? Of course not. Because he says if the dough, it refers to the system of sacrifices, the Le Leviticus priesthood and the Old Testament. And then people who would come to offer sacrifice for God were instructed in, no in numbers, when you present a cake, from the first of the flour you grind and set it aside as a sacred offering as you do with the first grain from the threshing floor. So the argument is that at the time they were instructed the first fruit, the first grain, the first harvest, they had to bring it to the Lord and offer it as a thanksgiving. So when they would have a first grain, they would take the grain, but the grain also you grind and you make cakes or you make a dough or some bread. So they were bringing also the dough of the first fruit, the grain or the cake, and they would offer it to the Lord. So if the offering is holy, so the whole thing is holy, it would sanctify them. And then the, the example that he's using is pointing to Abraham. Abraham was the first to be set apart. He's the father of the Israel nation, the fathers of the believers. So if Abraham, the first fruit, is holy, so his descendants, according to faith, according to the chosen blessing, the line of blessings, are going to be holy. And when it says holy, it doesn't mean holy like perfect, but it means set apart. They are a special group of people set apart. So just as Abraham and the patriarch were the, the root or the first fruit of that nation, so the rest of the nation are set apart to be with God. So that's another argument. Another argument in verse 4 is that God is able to graft and this is a very strong um, uh, picture that we have the grafting in chapter 11. If God is able to graft the Jews back into the olive tree, if the, uh, 11, 23, if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted again. For God has the power to graft them back. We saw that they were rejected because of their unbelief and their hardening of their hearts. They've been hardened for a time. So, but God has the power to grab them back with a condition. So, see, God is sovereign. God is the ruler or the sovereign of, of history, of the history of salvation. There's no salvation without God being involved and being initiating it and God's mercy. But there is also a human responsibility in salvation. So here, the responsibility says, if the Turn from their unbelief. That's the condition. So God is able to grab them back as soon as they will stop being rebellious and turn from their unbelief and believe in Jesus Christ. He will bring them back. So that's an argument. God is able to grab them back. Number five. God has already grafted the Gentiles, you and me, we are compared to wild olive branch. And if you know agriculture, like I've worked in orchard, apple orchard in Quebec before when I was young, so I've learned something how to, to graft uh, branches of something to, to the root, so to make it you know, profitable. Or sometimes you would start like new trees just by grafting them, and then it would uh, create roots, and then you would uh, uh, go and plant it. So, so this is a, a picture. So, the root is Israel, and we are compared to wild olive. And normally, it's not something that you would do. It's kind of unnatural to, to get like the cultivated plant and then take a wild tree or wild branch and, and graft it into the natural one, uh, the, to, to the original one. It normally you don't. So you take a cultivated one and you graft it in the cultivated root not the other way around. So God says, imagine you are a wild olive branch 
and God succeeded to graft you to the original root. So if God is able to do that with you, He is able to do it with the natural branches that have been set aside because of their unbelief, but they are the natural. So God says, hey, wait a minute, Gentiles, don't think too highly of yourself. You're just the wild olive tree. It's a grace. You've been planted here. But these branches have been cut off just because of their unbelief for a time. So to allow you to be grafted in, so don't be too proud because God when they will turn from their unbelief, it will be very easy for him to graft the natural olive branch to the natural olive root. And also there's an exhortation in that. It's like, don't boast, don't be too proud of yourself because you, know, you must fear the Lord into this process because you are not supporting the root. Because sometimes we think like the church, like we are so important in God's plan of salvation. So Paul is reminding us, don't think too highly of yourself because Israel was there first and Israel was, is the root, is, is the, the main plant. And you are only a branch being grafted. So don't think too highly of yourself. So there's a lesson for humility uh, on, in, this, in this text on that. So that's an argument. And the last argument that I want to bring is uh, verse 12 and 15 are two very strong statements that are attesting the salvation of Israel, but also with a promise that when it will take place, it will bring a greater blessing to the world. You know, and, and this is how it says that if their trespass, when they disobeyed the Lord, means riches for the world. You know, they, they disobeyed the Lord, and then it has enrich your life because salvation came to the Gentile, to you and me. So we have benefited from that. It has enriched the world, the salvation that Israel was keeping for themselves when they disobeyed. Salvation came to the whole world, to all every nation. So that has blessed the nation because we are blessed by God and we have been enriched. So if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more, and there's always many how much more in Paul's dialogues and teaching, how much more will their full inclusion mean? When God will bring them back, how much more of a greater blessing? And verse 15 compares it to like a life from the dead. And if you look at prophecies concerning Israel and Ezekiel chapter 37, you see the exact picture of that when it talks about the, the, the dry bones, and then God is speaking to the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy to the wind from the north, the east, the, so, the south, to, to, to bring life into these dry bones. And then these dry bones have some uh, muscles coming and the nerves coming. And, and then they, they, they come back to life. And it is a picture that the nation of Israel had been scattered in the nations. It's the time the, the, of the nation. It's called in the Bible. But then they would bring them back to life, to existence, and they would bring them back to Israel. And this miracle took place in 1948. So God has always been involved, has never cut them off completely, has never rejected His people. And you and I, we are saved today because all of this wonderful love of God and salvation has been uh, spread around the world through the nation of Israel. And from their, even the negative part of their life, their disobedience, then more riches came unto us because this is how we, salvation came to us. They rejected Jesus Christ. You, you heard the message from Pastor Jennifer these last few, few weeks. When they came to, to preach at the temple and when this, this man was being healed, they arrested them, they beat them, they put them into prison, they, they, they persecuted Christians, they were afraid of the message, they didn't want Jesus Christ to be their savior, they, they put him to death, they rejected their savior. But here we see that even that, God is so merciful and God is so faithful. What he had started with Abraham is going to continue. So let's look back at the mystery that we have been talking about in uh, slide number, number five to understand the mystery. And let's read this text. Romans 11, verse 25 and 26. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, 
brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening or a blindness. That's the same word. You can translate it either way. In part, it's in part, it's for a time, until the full numbers of the Gentile has come in. So there's a duration of time. God has a calendar of events. Things will happen. You don't know the date. God knows the date and he knows how and he knows when and all of this. And in this way, Israel will be saved as it is written. It is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And there's many lessons in this wonderful text that we are reading uh, this morning. First of all, it is a mystery. A mystery is a truth that had not yet at that point been revealed. It's like, you know, when you cook a dish and you lift up the lid and then you smell, mmm, smells good. So you want to know like if you are being successful uh, in something or you take your spoon and then you, you taste it. You, 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 you disclose a bit of the fragrance and what it is going to be like. You're, you're looking at it. The dish is not completed, but you, you still get a glimpse of that. So it's like a, a glimpse into the heart of God. Uh, some revelation, some understanding that we didn't have before, something we didn't know. So God here communicated special revelation to Paul in these matters. And there are three parts. The first one is Israel's hardening or their blindness is for a limited period of time. Number two, the salvation of the Gentiles will precede, will come first before the full salvation, before all Israel will be saved. Okay, So it comes first. And it says, until the full number of the Gentile has come in. So what does that mean, the full number? It doesn't mean that every single human being on the face of the earth will be saved. But all those that, are, that have heard, that the message of the gospel will have gone throughout all the world. And people will have a, a chance to respond to it. And the numbers of those who would open their heart to Jesus will be. And God has a time. God has a calendar. God knows every creature. And God will have a time and from that time. So the salvation of Israel is not going to happen until that time. And then the hardening or the blindness would be removed. Okay, so that, that is like the, the truth about this, this uh, mystery. And what will remove this blindness? Uh, we may only speculate on that. Some people I was reading yesterday says, the church, we are meant to go and evangelize Israel. And then because uh, it creates, we see that in uh, chapter 11, it creates a jealousy. The salvation of the Gentiles is meant to create a jealousy to the Israelites. And then from us, the church, then the message would go back to Israel. That's one theory, but most of us are not really uh, in agreement with that. What we have uh, received as teaching more is this dramatic event is yet going to happen in the future and we read in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when the tribulation will come and the battle for instance the battle of Armageddon will come and it is prophesied in the book of Zechariah at the time that the nations will come to fight against Jerusalem that would be the the biggest the fiercest the most horrible battle of all times the nations of the world will come with their horrible weapons and at that time this is in the tribulation the church is not there at that time jesus christ will come down to save his people the deliverer will come from zion from the heavenly zion and at this this time we we read a, a wonderful um prophecy in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 you, you will like it I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and then they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son who is the only son and they will weep, weep bitterly over him like uh, the bitter weeping over her 
firstborn. There are so many details in those prophecies from these old prophets of the past pointing with precision to events future that you cannot miss the message of that, that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Anybody who knows a little bit of the Bible knows what it is talking about. So at this time, when did these fierce battle, and in Zechariah chapter 14 says, um, I will gather all the nation to fight against Jerusalem, in verse 3, then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fought in times past. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and on the Mount of Olives will split apart. This is a very, like, big moments, things will happen. The, the earth will, will tremble and things, signs and wonders will take place in this moment. This is depicting times that have not yet come. But Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come. So that's a very, very important statement. Let's go to slide number seven, because we will learn something about not only the, the, the salvation of Israel, but it will be uh, uh, a deeper significance to our own salvation before we share the Lord's Supper concerning the Israel salvation. Based on that mystery that we just uh, read, number one, Israel and the Gentiles are saved in the same way through faith in Christ the Deliverer. You know, there are many interpretations when it comes to Israel, the church, salvation, the kingdom of God. There are all sorts of theological interpretation. And some say even that there are two different ways of salvation. That Israel, because of their unique privileged position, will have access to another way to get saved because they are the special people of God. And then the church, we are saved through Jesus Christ, believing. This is false. This is not happening. Because even in this text that we have here, it says the deliverer will come. And this is, they need a deliverer. They need a rescuer the same way that you and I need the res rescuer that, we, that save us from our sin. There's only one way of salvation. And this is exactly why Romans 9, 10, and 11 has been given. Okay, just for a moment, come back with me to Romans chapter 2 and chapter 3. Roman is one unit. We sometimes think that Romans 9 to 11 is like a, 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 a walking away from the rest of the, the book, but it is not. It is to reinforce, it is a continuity, and it is in full agreement with the doctrines of justification by faith that you find in the early chapters of the book of Romans. In the book of Romans chapter 2, it talks to the Jews first. Ooh, the Jews, you think you are so smart. You think you are the light of the nation. You think you are the teachers of the, the ignorant Gentiles and all of this. But you also sin. So that's, that's a paraphrase of chapter 2. You, you sin as much as the Gentile. So even though you think you are special people, you, you, you sin. So then you, you go to, to chapter 3, and then you will find even more. Well then... Should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. So, so you find this truth in the early part of Romans. And then in chapter 4, it's clear. You cannot be saved by the, the, doing the law. But Abraham is our example. You can only be justified by faith. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And verse 28, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is clear. And the opening statement of Romans, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Then when you come later in Romans chapter 10, you find the same truth said in different words. The scripture says, everyone who believes in him, everyone means all men, will never be ashamed. There is no difference between Jew and Greek because they all have the same Lord who gives richly 
to all who call on him, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what you read in the opening chapters of Romans is strengthened, and this is a kind of a conclusion, make it clear, there is no more confusion among the salvation of Israel and the salvation of the Gentiles. There is no two way of salvation, there is one way of salvation. They need a deliverer, just like you needed a deliverer. Say amen to that. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, now we continue. Number two, the coming of the deliverer that all Israel will be saved in will be in connection with the second coming of Christ. When is it going to, to happen? It is going to happen at the second coming of Christ, just like I read from Zechariah chapter 12 and chapter 14 uh, previously. These event points to that time uh, that are yet uh, to come. Number three, the removal of ungodliness from Jacob reminds us that there is no salvation apart from repentance. Look at the text. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. In the same way, as you have been saved, you have to repent from your sin. You have to acknowledge your sin. And you have to remove ungodliness and godlessness from your life through repentance. It's the same thing when it comes to the salvation of Israel. There's no difference. A redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from their transgressions. There is a turning away from transgression that is necessary for salvation. And it talks about ungodliness or godlessness or the end of rebellion, the disobedience and the unbelief and the, the blindness that they had. And then Romans chapter 11, 23 says, And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them again. So there is this if they do not continue. And so there is a repentance that is part of the salvation of the Jew in the same way that there is a, a repentance that was necessary and to you walk with the Lord. And this means that if you claim today to be a believer in Jesus Christ, but you persist in disobedience or you persist in ungodliness in any form, one day expect to hear these frightening words from the Lord, I do not know you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Repentance is a necessary part of the salvation of the Jews and our own salvation. Number four, the forgiveness of sins is the primary need of every single individual who came alive in this world. Romans 11, 27, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The removal of sin is a necessary part of salvation. You know, in today's modern Christianity, you, you hear another gospel many, many times. It is extremely popular. It's in books, it's in movies, it's on TV, a big preacher, big churches. It's called a make you feel good gospel. A gospel that just builds you up emotionally, help you as a man, as a businessman, to make you successful in life, to make you feel Better, you know, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you, you like yourself more, you know. It takes you a negative uh, self-image and it builds you up into uh, uh, something that you like to do. And the church makes you feel good. It's build but th this is not the message of John the Baptist. This is not the message of Jesus Christ. You know how they came to, to pr the, the first message that John the Baptist preached and the first message that Jesus Christ preached? The very first one, repent. For the kingdom of God is near. Jesus says, if you don't repent, you will perish. You know, like, it, it's not like a positive self-image, you know, a, a manicure that, that you, you, you get to make you look good or make you feel good. But today, this is what we hear. This is what we hear. There are parts of the gospel that is very positive, that, that, that brings positive. You obey God, you will be blessed. You know, there will be some forms of blessing coming of you. But that's not the fundamental need 
that you have in your life. That is why in Lighthouse, when we do mission, we don't do only humanitarian. We have refused to do that. We have refused to practice a social only gospel. Do good deeds, do good deeds to other people. There must be an element of preaching repentance for salvation and through faith in Jesus Christ. There must be this element. Otherwise, we are missing the point. And this is exactly what we see, we, we see here. Let me say it in this way. Salvation meets our fundamental need to be reconciled with the Holy God. The fundamental need that you and I have is to be reconciled with the Holy God. If we don't have that, we have nothing. You may have money in your bank account. You may have popularity and success in many, many forms. If you are not reconciled with the Holy God, you have nothing at the end. Amen? Amen. True is just forgiveness of all our sins through the death of Jesus Christ. The just forgiveness. There is one way to get forgiven. Jesus Christ took your punishment and my punishment, and he died, he was punished. God judged my sinfulness over his own beloved son so that I can be saved and you can be saved. So that is the message of God. And the forgiveness of our sin, number five, is based on God's covenant, a promise, the promise that he made to Israel the elections because of their forefathers. And this is really important because the gifts of God, the promises of God, the calling of God, the election of God are irrevocable. It's not going to change. God said it to Abraham and he will, he will do it. So this morning as we close and, and go to communion, to me, what I have learned in this study, its personal study, has touched my heart and has refreshed me because as the title says, uh, what, what was that <laughs> the title? The Mystery of Israel's Salvation. Okay. <laughs> I need to refresh myself. <laughs> the Mystery of Israel's Salvation. But what I have learned in studying these chapters is in fact, it's the mystery of God. It's the mystery of discovering the nature of God. You know, in chapter 9, we really talked about the the mercy of God, the merciful God, that God is sovereign, he has a desire or he should punish, but instead he chooses to reveal his mercy. And that is the heart, the heart of the gospel and the heart uh, that, w that we, we have seen. So to me, to do this study on the salvation of Israel, I discovered that God is just because God saved Israel in the same way that he saves me. There is no difference. A deliverer is necessary. A removal of ungodliness is necessary. A removal of sin and a forgiveness of sin is necessary. And there is only one way that they will get it. It's the same way that you will get it in me. See, it's the same thing. It's just a time. The time is different. The, the full number, the completions of the Gentiles that are to be saved must be completed. And then all Israel will be saved when they will meet dramatically this, this deliverer that will come to save us. And then they will mourn. They mourn that means that they will regret, they will repent, they will cry over their foolishness and their blindness. They will, you know, and then they will turn to him and he will be saved. And then the, after that, when the millennium will come, because the time of the calendar of God is not finished, uh, and we don't have time to, to talk about it this morning, but there are still many events before the eternity, before the new Jerusalem come down. There's still like a time of tribulation. There is still a time of the millennium, 1,000 years of rule of Jesus Christ on the earth where Israel converted will be the serving, serving God and, and then, and they will be the riches of the world because they will walk with Jesus Christ, they will acknowledge him in this time. But what it has done also, this study to me, it's a lesson of humility to prevent pride and to not to forget where we're coming from, what it costs for, to be saved what Jesus Christ has done to, to do, and not to 
uh, have a confusion or some kind of pride over Israel that have rejected Jesus Christ. And instead, it's to have compassion for them and to have compassion for all the lost. Because when you come, and this text, it talks about the severity and the kindness of God. And, and again, I say this is the mystery of God. This text is about the mystery of God. What is about the severity of God? What is the severity of God? What is the kindness of God? It's like two things that are in opposition. Like the holiness and the judgment and the unfailing love. This is an opposition. But this is God we're talking about. And God has a plan. A plan, he has a calendar. We don't have, like we just walk and we look like a, a bunch of ants. We're just going left and right, left and right. But God sees the big picture and he has a time for everything. And he has a eternity in line and he is preparing us for eternity. And in that, Israel has a very important role. And because of their unbelief for a time and their hardening for a time, we have been grafted and we are saved today. And today we are going to just... Be in awe of what Jesus Christ is and what God has done in the big plan of God. And if you are not saved here today, you need to be saved. Don't leave this room uncertain when God is calling you to come to Him. And if you have never shared the gospel to someone or if you have stopped sharing the gospel, this morning is a call to refresh and renew the message of salvation, the mystery of salvation is the greatest, the most important message that you and I, that's why we exist. Amen? amen. Say amen with, uh, look at me in my eyes and say amen. amen. Yes, yes, that's the way to say amen. Hallelujah.